Ready when you are, Medi. Okay, thank you. I'm here, so I think we can start. We've got one minute, so let's just wait for one minute. You, would you need me, Vuyo? Uh, not really, Medi. Okay, let's just give it one minute for the last few people to join. Okay, it's one o'clock, so let's start. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you. For I can't hear Madi anymore. You can't hear you, Madi. You can't hear me. Okay, oi, my microphone is on. Let me just quickly... It is on. Now we can hear you. <clears throat> no, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes, you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great, yes. thank you. Okay, no, so, so I just was saying welcome everybody on the Saturday afternoon for, for joining us for this lecture on this terribly important topic. Um, I'm going to be uh, introducing Professor Mark Mendelssohn now. Um, and it really is a great, great privilege to have Professor Mendelssohn take time out of his extremely busy schedule to not only prepare this lecture, but to give it to us. So let me tell you about him. He is Professor of Infectious Diseases and Head of the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine at Grotesque Hospital, at, which is part of the University of Cape Town. He trained in infectious diseases in Cambridge and undertook postdoctoral work on TB at the Rockefeller University in New York before moving to UCT in 2001. His area of expertise is national and international policy relating to antimicrobial resistance. And he is the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance. He led the clinical response to the COVID to COVID-19 at Grotesque Hospital and was chair of the clinicians group of the first ministerial advisory committee on COVID-19. He continues to advise the Minister of Health and is a, as a member of this current committee. He is the immediate past president of the International Society for Infectious Diseases and the Federation of Infectious Diseases Society of Southern Africa. Please give Professor Mendelssohn a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Madi, and uh, uh, thank you for for um, giving me this opportunity to to speak today. And uh, it's nice to meet everybody on the call. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to um, to come and join this discussion. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and, and as I do that. Um, I'm very cognizant um, of the fact that there's a, a fairly wide um, uh, breadth of, of people, experience, and, and knowledge on the call, uh, on the um, sorry, on the um, on this talk. Um, Madi, can you just make? Can you just uh, ensure that I you can see my slides? You, we can, can see you see your my... slides. And we can see Lovely. your slides, and we can see you. And in fact, I need to disappear. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. OK, so. Um, so, yes, th th this is a this really is an enormous topic, I think, as you as everybody can appreciate. And, um, you know, it, it's difficult when trying to prepare a, a, a talk like this to try and balance um, the, the sort of clinical and scientific aspects with it um, for, for everybody. So. While some of the slides will will be very much in the frame of a of a scientific presentation, I'm going to try and 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 um, take time with each of the slides just to to really explain um, in in basic in a basic sense what uh, what what we're trying to get over. Um, and you know what I'm going to do is really split into two parts, and the other important thing I think to say is that I'm going to try and leave you know, a, a quite a, a time for for 
questions and discussion because uh, that it is such an enormous topic and there's so much uh, interest in the media, um, so many different uh, parts of this problem um, are in the public domain and, and everybody's going to have their own issues and questions, particularly when it comes to the second part of the talk. So there should be um, ample time for discussion. But I'm going to break down this talk into the into these two parts. The first part, I'm really going to concentrate on the virus itself, um, some of the biology of it, how our bodies mount an immune response to it. Uh, that's important talk about vaccines later on um, and also the variants uh, that you'll have all have heard of, about. How we detect, you know, what tests do we use, what are the practices and pitfalls of using the tests and how our treatment um, has, has really progressed in the past uh, 12 months. And then in the second part I'm going to really look at um, some of the pub these public health interventions that we've all come to, to know and uh, love or hate, or love and hate probably. Um, what's, the, what's the basis behind them? What's the science behind them? Why are they important? Touch on some of the, the issues around lockdowns, look at the new variants, um, share some information with you uh, that I'm able to, and then look at the vaccine strategy or lack thereof. Um, and that's really what we're going to be doing in the next uh, hour, hour and a half or so. So really COVID has presented an absolutely unprecedented uh, response by the scientific um, community across all spheres of science, um, from basic science to behavioural science. And this, this graph just gives an indication on the unbelievable uh, work and speed of publication um, that has occurred in uh, only 12 months. You know, 86,000 plus publications on this uh, single problem uh, in, in one year is, is un unbelievable and it's impossible to keep up. In fact, now many of the publications are produced in preprint forms for people to access before peer review. In other words, before it's been scrutinized. So you know, in, sometimes th there's got to be a lot of caution when you're actually trying to, um, to interpret these. And occasionally the press get hold of preprints before peer review and that, that can be a bit problematic. But really, I mean, you'll share with me this, I think this uh, amazement at just how much work has happened and how much uh, this, the topic has progressed. And so one of the caveats you know, and disclaimers in this, well, disclaimers really in this talk is, is that you know, things are changing so rapidly that um, much of what I say now is ingrained and it, it is, is, is not going to change much, but m much of it, further, further, it will be further illuminated with, with continued work. So it's you know, 12 short months pretty much since this posting came up on ProMed, which is a, a surveillance program of the International Society for Infectious Diseases, which basically monitors all traffic uh, on the internet in discussion around emerging and re-emerging infections, uh, infectious diseases. And ProMed was um, responsible for uh, identifying, first to identify SARS in 2003 when it broke, uh, Ebola uh, in a number of the uh, um, uh, epidemics uh, and a variety and it's an amazing resource which is free to everybody and you can get daily or weekly posts but on the 29th of December in 2019 this post came up um, for a request for urgent um, consultation because there had been a cluster of severe pneumonia cases in Wuhan in China and this was posted uh, by ProMed and what was interesting is that uh, ProMed posts are all moderated by experts and one of the experts Marjorie Pollock who had been involved in SARS which you see the post on your left hand side of the screen in 2003 
Marjorie immediately put a link together and basically said, look, I've seen this before. This is really reminiscent of what happened in 2003, uh, the, the sort of cluster of pneumonia cases uh, and, the, and what we were learning of it very rapidly, very reminiscent of the original rumours around the SARS 2003 outbreak. So already alarm bells um, were being rung in right at the beginning of January. And as you know, um, initially there was a, a focus on um, this seafood wet market um, in Wuhan, where it was thought uh, could have been the origin, uh, originator of this outbreak of human um, infections. And the, the theory was that it had been passed from, potentially from an animal to food. You can see that unfortunately um, this market, like many others, um, in China uh, and some other countries in, in Asia. Um, they uh, have live animals, often exotic animals, um, and these are then uh, slaughtered for, for, for food. And this was the original uh, concern, was that this was uh, where the outbreak began. And this is a busy slide, it's a grub, but it, I don't want you to concern yourself with reading um, it. I'm going to take you through just a couple of important issues. I mean, this is basically, again, the speed of activity and uh, developments over a very short time point. And what the bars show is in the dark orange, these are individual cases or the number of cases which were linked to that wet food, seafood market in Hunan, and the lighter orange are those cases that were not linked. And if you go to the sort of left-hand side of this graph, you'll see that even on the sort of 7th, 10th, 13th of, um, of December, there were already cases that had been were diagnosed retrospectively that were um, nothing to do with this seafood market. And what we think happened is that the seafood market probably acted as a multiplier or there were transmission events from animal to humans potentially, but the probable amplifier was with a human to human at that stage. And then the, the, the seafood market really became much of a muchness because you started to get community spread within Wuhan. And what's important about this is that very rapidly um, after that first identification of cases clustered in people that had visited this um, wholesale food market. The, um, the China CDC identified it, the market was closed, and the China CDC rapidly got its act together and started um, shutting down. Um, they had sequenced uh, the virus, the entire virus by the 8th of January, just absolutely unprecedented speed and shared it. And they had developed a, a diagnostic test, the first PCR test um, reagents were provided uh, again around the 10th of, of, um, of January. And then, as you know, uh, they started to lock down um, and try to control the, um, the outbreak. So there was really unprecedented speed. And again, you know, although the, the seafood market was the initial uh, focus of attention, it was clear that there was human transmission um, before, prior, or there were transmission events involving humans prior to uh, anything to do with the seafood market. Very quickly, this um, the origin of this virus was suggested by, if you take the virus, if, you, if you're able to isolate the virus, you can sequence it, you can re basically read its genetic code. Like all living organisms, um, there's a genetic code and it reads like a book, a sequence of, uh, of letters. And you can basically, uh, with modern day computing, uh, be able to line up these sequences and you can compare them to other sequences in the database of similar viruses that had been um, uh, had been obtained from different sources. And bats, as you know, um, are uh, a common source of, of viruses. Um, they've been involved particularly in other corona, these other coronaviruses, SARS in 2003, and the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome virus, MERS, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and what they showed uh, in red on this sort of phylogenetic tree that you see on the right-hand side 
is that these 2019 novel coronaviruses were closest linked to a bat virus, um, the bat coronavirus RATG13. What they also showed in this very colourful panel on your left is that the receptor that the virus binds to in human cells and in actually in other mammalian cells was a receptor that we call ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It's basically, if you think of a, of a lock and key, the lock is the ACE2 receptor, sits on our cells. The key is the uh, virus, fits in, locks, and then opens up so that the virus gets into the cell and can replicate and do its, uh, do its worst. So again, this was incredibly rapid in January, and it points to the fact that this virus is of probable bat origin. What is still unclear is the exact whether uh, what the exact intermediate host is. And there's been a lot of, um, of work on this, a lot of uh, media attention, particularly around pangolins. Um, pangolins, the Malaysian pangolin, um, is able to, um, to be infected by um, SARS, uh, SARS bat coronaviruses and a coronavirus very, very similar to SARS-CoV-2. Um, in the, the, the long and short of the studies are um, that it's unlikely to be um, the definitive intermediate host. Um, other, you'll have heard also of mink uh, being uh, infected and huge culls of mink are in farms in, in Denmark and in the Netherlands because there were episodes of mink to human um, spread. Uh, turtles and uh, snakes have also been um, shown to be able to be infected, but again, we don't think that that's a major um, focus. And then domestic animals can also be infected. In fact, the yak, um, that that lock and key, that uh, that receptor, the ACE2, is actually that that affinity. The the the, the mechanism is strongest for the for, for yak, and whether yak in China were an intermediate host, we don't know, um, but it's possible. We do know that um, cats and dogs can be infected, and there are there's evidence of of household pets uh, being infected in in households that have uh, uh, people infected. Um, and even we know lions and tigers have been uh, infected, but I don't think that that's a major host. We certainly hope it's not because lions and tigers aren't generally domesticated and are. Yeah. But um, so then uh, they're, they're, so there may be these intermediate hosts and then humans, but the epidemic and the pandemic that we're now faced with is being driven by uh, human to human transmission. Uh, and that is what, what we're seeing uh, within this pandemic. There have also been reports of potential um, uh, that could this be a virus which uh, was generated from a laboratory um, in China. Uh, the answer, uh, I think, is absolutely not. Um, but and there is a, a WHO group who are being uh, who are, are awaiting. They were um, they were stopped uh, recently from from starting their work. But I think now that that is going to go ahead. And that will be a collaborative work to try and uh, really investigate uh, the exact origins and transmission points um, in, in, in the initial outbreak in China. So that will obviously generate results and we look forward to hearing more about that. So what about this virus? It's a, it's a, you'll all have come, become accustomed to this, the, the, these projections or crown like spikes giving it its name, Corona. Um, a coronavirus on the surface of the um, of the virus. When you when you sort of do a cross section of the virus, you can see that in the core um, is the genetic material of the virus, which is RNA. So um, our, we humans and many other species have uh, DNA as our as our main uh, as our genetic material. Um, this virus is a, a single stranded RNA virus. Um, in the vi in with the RNA is a is a structural protein called the nucleocapsid protein uh, that forms its core, and then outside uh, there's the membrane, and this spike protein, which we're going to talk about a number of times and come back to, 
uh, spike protein is the main receptor by which um, uh, the virus binds onto our, our cells, and gains entry. And that, as you see, goes across the membrane. Uh, and then there are two other structural, uh, main structural proteins, the, the, the membrane protein M and the envelope protein E. And all of these proteins, these structural proteins, um, are involved in helping the virus to replicate, uh, to kill cells uh, when necessary, and also they're involved in, in mediating some of the inflammation that occurs um, as a result of the, of the viral infection. And that inflammation um, also um, goes towards you know, causing some of the damage. So, so what about replication of the virus? Let's look at this virus lifestyle. Here's a nice picture of, of the coronavirus and uh, one of the coronaviruses is budding. Well, it could be, I suppose, attaching and getting in or budding out, but uh, we're gonna look now at the life cycle of this virus. And this is a schematic showing the binding. And, and as you can see again, there are these um, spike proteins uh, which are on the surface of the virus. And the spike protein has uh, two areas, S1 and S2. And on your right hand side, as you're looking at it, the spike, S1 um, part of the spike, binds initially to the host cell receptor. Remember the lock. So the spike and virus is the key and it binding to it into its lock, which is this protein on our cell surfaces, on the host cell surfaces in humans or whichever, whichever um, uh, species. Uh, and it binds to the ACE2 receptor. And as it binds to the receptor, there's a conformational change, structural change of the way that the protein is folded and it brings into contact the, the second part, the S2 part of the uh, of the pro spike protein brings the virus down to the cell and you get fusion of the viral of the virus membrane to our cells. And again, this is, you know, there's a lot of pictures going on here, but I'm going to explain it very simply. So on the left hand top side, you've seen what we've just discussed. The virus gains entry through a process we call endocytosis, bringing in. And once in, the, a series of events occur to allow the RNA, the genetic material of the virus, to enter the cytoplasm of the cell. This has nothing to do with our cell DNA. This is all happening in the cytoplasm of the cell, not in the nucleus. Now, the RNA is so configured that it actually can use, immediately use our cellular machinery to start to replicate and produce some of the proteins it needs in its replication cycle. And the first two thirds of it being translated, changed from RNA into protein, produces some proteins, one of which is a very important enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, and that enzyme is involved in producing new strands of the genetic material, new copies of the genetic material. So the first thing it's able to do is produce some of the equipment it needs to enable the new genetic material to be replicated. The rest of that other third of, of um, the conversion starts to produce those structural proteins that I talked about on the surface of the cell. And then Together, those structural proteins and the RNA go through an area of the cell called the Golgi apparatus, where everything is put together and assembled. You then have an assembled new virus which buds out of the cell, exocytosis, so it leaves the cell able to infect another cell and so on. And so these areas, the, this, why is it important to know about the life cycle? It's important to know about the life cycle um, to appreciate what the potential targets for future treatments might be um, and to really understand how it's doing its damage. And in terms of how it's doing its damage, this schematic really just shows the broad degree of cells, broad different types of cells and organs that the virus can bind to and therefore can infect and effect. 
and it the virus entry doesn't only require this one um, receptor, the ACE2, but it also requires some other proteins, this TMPRSS2 protein and others. But basically the, the bottom line is, if you see on the left, it's not only on upper airways and our lungs, which we all sort of know about because we get, you know, we know it's predominantly, COVID is predominantly a chest infection. And when we get tested, we have nasal swabs stuck into our nose. So it makes sense that that's where the virus might be found. But but as you know, it also can affect many other organs. People can present with diarrhea and vomiting, so it can affect the cells of the gut, it can affect the heart, eyes, liver, bladder, basically all of what you can see on the left-hand side potentially have cells that can be infected and therefore affected by the viral infection. So how do we respond to um, the virus as inf infecting us? Well, this is our immune system's response. And I'm going to keep this, again, very basic. If I put up a, a, a slide of actually all the interactions and the interactions and the complexity of the immune system, you'd almost not be able to see anything for the amount of lines and, and dots and everything. And basically, I mean, it, very simplistically, I think what we need to know in the top of this figure shows, again, what I've just shown you, the replication of the virus. Once the virus leaves the cell, it starts to interact with our immune system. And the first cells that are, are uh, 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 seen, or the virus, first cells that see the virus, are cells of, of part of an, a part of a, our immune response called the innate immune system. And basically, these are cells which are scouring, placed in all the different areas of the body and scouring the body looking for invaders basically and proteins um, on the uh, on the again the the the, um, the virus is able to get into these cells and this the, particularly a cell called the dendritic cell this cell sits at epithelial surfaces lungs gut uh, skin it basically recognizes um, a virus internalizes it cuts it up and then it actually is able to place on its surface in um, combination with important signalers for our um, immune system, other parts of the immune system. It displays these on the surface of, its, of the cell, basically saying, look, here I am. Um, I've got a viral, a virus or a pathogen infecting me. And that those um, proteins in conjunction with these other important molecules are recognized by what we call um, lymphocytes and which there are T and B cells. Um, the T cells, uh, the helper T cells, these are important cells which help to orchestrate the next phase of the response, which we call adaptive. And the T cells can produce a particular type of T cell, a CD8 cytotoxic T cell, which recognizes virus infected cells and can destroy it. And it also helps our B cells, a different type of cell, to produce antibodies. And antibodies are proteins which uh, recognize specific sequences on proteins of the virus, bind to them, and stop the viruses in. Uh, uh, stop the viruses uh, infecting other cells. Now, this produces our immune response and to try and control the infection. At the same time, with time, some of the B and T cells are laid down as memory cells so that if we, in the future we um, actually have another infection with the virus, our immune response can be speeded up, basically, because in the beginning you're starting de novo. Once you've got these memory cells, it's very much more rapid. And so the B cell, the T cell um, responses, the adaptive immune response, are important in trying to control the virus. And at the same time, there's lots of chemicals released, which we call cytokines and chemokines, which again help direct the response but with cytokines can also cause some um, problems. And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about severity. But this is the basics of the immune response to the virus and how, of, uh, how we control. And we'll, again, we'll come back to antibody responses in particular when we talk about um, neutralization and variants.
And what we know, just this again, a complicated figure, but the bottom line is that we know that with antibodies, the recognition predominantly sits uh, at a site on that spike protein. So if you take away, if you genetically um, modify the spike uh, uh, protein to take away um, a particular part of it, then antibodies won't neutralize. So we know that our you know, largest amount of antibodies um, that actually control the inf to try and control the infection are targeted at a specific site on this spike protein. And again, we'll come back to why that's important. If you are infected naturally with um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID, does it provide protection? Well, there's this is a big question, how much protection for how long? And this is a big question um, that a lot of research groups are looking at. This was published about a week ago. It's a study called SIREN from the UK where they where they've followed up healthcare workers who've been tested every two to four weeks for evidence of the virus, both by PCR and antibodies. And they looked over 12, 12 months. And of, um, of 6,000 previously infected healthcare workers, there were only 44 um, reinfections, whereas in 14,000 without, there were 318 new infections, um, of which most were symptomatic. And basically what this study suggested was that if you're infected with SARS coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2, it's probably, you've probably got about an 85 protection, a percent protect of people who are infected have protection in that. Uh, uh, from that natural infection. How long that natural protection lasts is open to question, um, but it's uh, the studies to date certainly up to sort of six to eight months probably, but there's a lot of individual variation and we'll come back to that as well. So I'm going to touch now on, on the spectrum of disease. As you know, uh, once this virus gets in, the damage it can cause um, might be subclinical. In other words, we never know we are infected, but it doesn't cause a major um, clinical illness, and we call those people asymptomatic. Then there is a group um, who are defined as mild, and that doesn't mean that they're trivial symptoms. In fact, people with mild COVID can have extremely debilitating symptoms, but they are not people who are have severe pneumonia requiring hospitalization. That's the third group, the severe group that are hospitalized. And within that, there's a group that will go on to get critically ill and require ventilation and, and the necessity to be on intensive care units. So what about asymptomatic infection? I mean, how many people, what percentage of people actually are asymptomatically infected? There's been a lot of population-based studies which predict about 30 to 40 percent of people, um, but these studies are a bit problematic because the actual long-term follow-up to really be sure they're asymptomatic is poor. There was one study in a nursing home in the US which showed that although when they were tested, 24 people, uh, 27 people in that nursing home had no symptoms at all. Within the next seven days, 24 of those people actually developed symptoms. So in other words, they were pre-symptomatic. Pre so actually defining um, how many people are asymptomatic is, is problematic. And then the other thing to say is even if you'd have no symptoms at all, if we look very closely with advanced x-rays, um, even with normal x-rays, but with CT scanning in this study, a lot of people actually have some changes in the lungs. So even though you're, you don't show symptoms, we know that the, the virus uh, can cause effects in different organs. Slightly more, this is a meta-analysis, systematic review meta-analysis, and basically um, what it shows is that um, of all the study of the studies so far looking at the number of asymptomatics in the community and transmission is probably you know somewhere between 15 and 40 percent i would say if you take both types of studies together now how many people who do get infected and show symptoms are going to be in those different three different categories well we know from a study in china of over 72,000 cases looking and trying to to show this um, that about 80% of people will not require hospitalization. A smaller percentage will 
require hospitalization, and then a smaller percentage even than that will be critically ill. So if you do get COVID, you are still uh, most likely to have a mild infection if you do require if you do get symptoms. What are the what are the risk factors for severity? Um, this basically shows an adjusted hazard ratio uh, plot for death. So anything on the right hand side of that red line is an increased hazard. Um, as you can see, um, men are more likely and older age groups, but men are more likely than women to have the more severe COVID. Um, the, the, as you know, with advancing age, the hazard ratio increases markedly. And then there are the comorbidities, pre-existing illnesses, um, in diabetes, the degree of the severity of your or paucity of control, in other words, poor, more poorly controlled diabetics who have higher tests called the HbA1c will have a higher ratio, uh, adjusted hazard ratio, in other words, more likely to get severe illness, people with chronic kidney disease. And then the big concern was in, the, in our HIV population. And what it suggests is if you have HIV, you've got about a 1.5 or to two um, hazard ratio for death more severe. So what this tells us as well is if you do have comorbidities, particularly diabetes, it's a really good idea to try and con get your control doing really well. With HIV, we want to make sure that uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy is being taken, basically improving general health and controlling uh, comorbidities is, is important. Now, these are a list of the common symptoms you can see, uh, both in uh, uh, and, and uncommon uh, symptoms, but this is by far and away not an exhaustive list. Um, and, you know, the common symptoms, fever, dry cough and fatigue, uh, are in the sort of uh, amounts that you can see percentages of people, fever being the most common, but not invariable. Um, and there are many symptoms involved and the many symptoms involved relate to the many organs uh, that can be affected as we've seen by the virus and in severe disease people are even more sick and can get um, you know exhaustion difficulty you know the, the brain function can reduce so they can become somnolent and, uh, and confused uh, the pneumonia becomes much more um, serious and uh, there can be kidney injuries uh, and, and others. But again, as I said, there's, this is far from exhaustive list. There's a lot of um, a lot of dermatological skin, interest in skin and skin manifestations. Uh, there was something yesterday in the media about COVID tongue, about mouth. Um, and one of the other important things is is loss of sense of taste, uh, and in, more importantly, even loss of sense of smell. And indeed, there was a study very recently, I think last week, which showed, just looked at people rating their sense of smell um, at the time that they were, uh, uh, the time that they uh, produced, got symptoms versus what it was like before. And basically, smell, the loss of smell alone has a really high sensitivity for predicting if you've got COVID. So the sensitivity is about 66%. And if you've got it, the specificity, particularly at the moment with such high numbers, um, is about 97% chance that you've actually got it. So if you develop a loss of sense of smell at the moment, um, you've got an extremely high chance of having COVID. And in fact, at the bottom of the reference um, is actually a little calculator, an Excel spreadsheet calculator, which you can just pop in a few of your symptoms and you can get a, a probability of, um, of the fact you've got COVID or not. And olfactory dysfunction, anosmia can um, can in some people, in a few, in a small proportion of people, actually be very prolonged. And if it does last more than a few weeks, then there's this olfactory training that can be done, which does seem to improve um, senses of smell, uh, sniffing different um, different types, sub subsets of the sense of smell with rose, lemon, clove, and eucalyptus. Um, and then when you're, if you do have patients or if you yourself have uh, an osmia, then obviously there's some safety issues. And there's some, some soft evidence at the moment for a few adjuncts with vitamin A and uh, omega-3 as, as a possibility, but I, I wouldn't rush out and buy those.
as we talk about uh, this shift between um, mild and, uh, and severe disease, what one needs to appreciate is that what's driving disease in the very early stages of having being infected is really the virus and the response um, that the virus is generating. Um, and then as things develop, in some people, there will be a component of increasing inflammatory response, which is um, in response to the virus. And in we know that in very severe COVID, that inflammation, um, our body's response plays a very important role. And, and there are many, many infections where this is also the case. Um, but as we go, as we shift through the stages of infection, those people that are going to get severe disease have increasing inflammation. And basically, in terms of what's happening in the lungs, these are little pictures of the air sacs, the alveoli, where gas exchange occurs within our lung tissue. And as you can see, as we go um, from a sort of healthy lung where there's air spaces and gas exchange can occur, as infection increases and becomes more severe, there's inflammation, fluid fills these air sacs that doesn't allow oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. And we get pneumonia and the symptoms of um, breathlessness, uh, cough and deterioration. And there's a lot of an inflammatory component in this. So this is part virus, part our body's immune response. Um, but this causes the predominantly um, severe respiratory illness that uh, that we see with COVID-19 in severe in patients with severe illness. And so the sort of time frame of progression um, in people that are going to get very severe COVID, we look at around day eight to 10. And if you are starting to have shortness of breath at that time, um, worsening cough, uh, continued fevers, then that's risk a risk uh, and, and a, a pointer that things are getting worse. And then usually things will start to get better, but in some people, obviously, they will require oxy help with oxygenation. And sadly, um, uh, some will die. And this inflammation has been termed, you've know, heard this, uh, this term uh, often in the press, a cytokine storm. And what's happening is that it's an abnormal response, immune response. The virus binds to the, the lung cells. It causes massive replication in the lungs. It prevents certain of the important immune response to get rid of the virus. Um, a lot of these chemicals that are released start to recruit more cells and produce more chemicals, these cytokines. And then there's a, as, with the accumulation of all these cells, it, it starts to get out of hand and you get a hyper inflammatory response, the so-called cytokine storm and these little IL-6, TNF, IL-1, these are all um, cytokines and they cause multi-organ dis uh, dysfunction, this acute respiratory distress syndrome in the lungs, um, requiring um, oxygen support and ventilation, kidney failure, and attack um, other organs like the heart. And this is the cytokine storm, which is associated with really severe infection. Are we getting any better? Are, is mortality improving in hospitalized severe patients? And they are in the most severe, and the answer is yes. And this is sort of severe, uh, like probability, a proportion of patients surviving in critical care. This is from a UK study, but we see this here in South Africa as well. As new treatments come in and as we get used to treating patients with very severe illness, there is an improvement in, uh, in survival. A proportion of patients will not only experience acute COVID, but will have persisting symptoms or symptoms which start later uh, than the acute illness. And by definition, there isn't a good internationally recognized edition of what we're calling long COVID or COVID long haulers, but uh, we're calling it long COVID, but we recognize oh, that this is a, a significant issue. And we, we would define it generally as people who are, have symptoms persisting or starting. Um, new symptoms starting, or both, uh, 28 days after the acute uh, becoming acutely unwell. And you know, what sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, the biggest study in the UK, looking at were people self-reporting symptoms with an app, of those who were self-reporting and were had no symptoms before and had tested positive, so we knew that they were COVID uh, positive. 
Um, so about 13% of people had symptoms for greater than 28 days. And by 12 weeks, about 2% um, had it. And that the five most predictive symptoms of getting long COVID in that first week when you had the first illness was fatigue, headache, muscle pains, hoarse voice and breathlessness. And women were more likely to be get long COVID, um, older people and those with obesity. And if you had more than five symptoms in the acute infection in the first week of illness, you were four times more likely to develop long COVID. We don't know what the susceptibility factors are at the moment, and but we do know that it can follow mild COVID um, just as easily as it can uh, occur in severe COVID. Although, in, in fact, saying that people with severe COVID are more likely to um, have long COVID signs. There's a very good publication in the British Medical Journal, which this graphic is taken from looking at the management, how we would treat people with long COVID. Um, most people, the important thing to say is that despite these persistent and very um, often unpleasant and debilitating symptoms, the long-term outlook is positive. And most people, uh, almost all people will improve. Uh, and the time course is very, is variable. And most people will be able to be managed just by a family practitioner. But some with more severe Ill, uh, manifestations or specific manifestations may need referral to rehabilitation experts like physios and occupational therapy, etc. It's a very holistic approach that needs to be taken. It needs to recognise that um, long COVID does have psychological uh, and psychiatric manifestations to mental health as well as um, organic um, illnesses with different organs um, and it's very much a mixed bag and difficult to predict um, what symptoms you're going to get or what symptoms you're not going to get um, but people who are asymptomatic are who symptoms totally um, uh, are um, no, 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 go away, um, most people, almost all people will not get them to have long COVID. This is really mainly in people who just have persisting and it's a small percentage. How do we detect COVID? How do we test? Now, many of you on the call will have had a, a test for COVID and, and what you're seeing is various people undergoing, and animals actually undergoing, excruciating things being stuck up their noses. It's not pleasant. Um, uh, but basically, we need to understand how we detect COVID. Um, the, there are sort of three type, uh, two types of tests. Uh, three, one, one type of test, uh, two type, one, one which actually detects the virus itself, and that's of two types. One is the PCR, um, and another is called the rapid antigen test. And then uh, one, one type of test, the type of test that detects our immune response, which is the antibody test. Now the rest, the tests, the PCR and the antigen test, both, both detect the virus. And the PCR detects the RNA, the genetic material, and the antigen test um, detects a protein on the surface, a structural protein on the surface. And both of them are detected in samples from our upper airways. That's when you have the swab taken, either from the nose or the, uh, previously from the oropharynx, and even now from saliva, we know that saliva can now be used. And there are pros and cons of all tests. Um, the PCR test requires a laboratory. The antigen test theoretically can be done at the bedside. Um, but these tests will be positive when the person has acute infection, when you have symptoms or the virus in the first, if you're asymptomatic, in the first week or so of having the virus in the body. On the other hand, antibody tests are taken from our tests which require a blood sample. They look for these proteins that are produced by our immune response, and they only start to appear in blood after around 10 days. So they are, by the time you have antibodies in your blood, 99.9% .9 of people will have no symptoms at all. So they're not good for tests for finding out whether you have current illness. They're good for finding out whether you've been exposed. An antibody test, the real beauty of antibody tests is in surveillance, uh, you know, national and local surveillance, not so much really in the management of COVID illness in an individual. What about interpreting a test? Many people say, well, I had a negative test, but I had symptoms. Well, each test, as I say, has its limitations. Now, this is looking at the PCR test. 
And the PCR test will have a false negative rate. In other words, you'll have COVID, but your test will be negative between 2 and 29, 30% of the time, meaning that the sensitivity of the test is around 70 to 98%. Now, whether or how you interpret that test depends on how much COVID there is around at the moment. At the moment, there's so much COVID around that even without a test, the pre-test probability of you having COVID if you have bond or symptoms is almost 100%, yeah? And so if you do a test which is negative in this current situation, it actually would still mean with this test, working out what the probability is, your post-test probability, if you have bond or symptoms and you have a negative test, currently in South Africa is still about 78% likely that you've actually got, a, got, got um, COVID. And even if you have two negative tests, if you've got really bond or symptoms, doctor says, yeah, you definitely got it. You still got about a 50% chance of having it. So the sensitivity of a test is, in, is affected by the pre-test probability. But at the moment in South Africa, we're in a pan and in a pandemic, if you've got barn door symptoms and a negative test, you've still got a very high likelihood of having it. And that's important because of quarantine isolation. So as I said, the testing of time, uh, the, test, the timing of the test is important. The PCR and the antigen tests in, in grey and red are really only useful in diagnosing acute infection. The antibody test occurs later and that only um, is of any use in in, um, in uh, uh, later uh, to tell that you've either had it or in surveillance. Okay, so the last part of this part of the talk in the next sort of five, ten minutes is just going to touch on some of the treatments that we have uh, been understood to work or not work um, in the last year. And, um, you know, the Donald uh, has been single handedly um, responsible for touting. Uh, majority of infections which don't work, um, including this wondrous pronouncement that perhaps putting light inside the body would kill the virus because it does an awful job on the, uh, an awful number, I think he said, on the lungs. And I would suggest that uh, POTUS has had a lack of evolution. So what do we know? Well, first thing we know is oxygen is king. And we know this, uh, and it's not surprising because oxygen um, is required when oxygen exchange in the lungs because of the pneumonia is impaired. And that can be anything from just uh, low flow nasal oxygen uh, with these little things in the nose to a mask, a simple mask, uh, which will deliver more oxygen. And then a special type of mask and bag where you're, where you're gaining much more oxygen delivery. And then um, short of putting a tube down into the lungs and helping with a mechanical ventilation with a ventilator, we, we now know uh, the importance of delivering very high flow oxygen to patients with very severe COVID at high flow rates and humidifying it. And this is called high flow nasal oxygen delivered by high flow nasal cannulae. It's very good because the cannula sits in the nose, it allows people to eat and talk. Um, and because it's humidified, it's much more comfortable and it reduces the work of breathing, reduces the dead space, which is areas of the lung which aren't involved in gas exchange um, and allows increased gas exchange. And Greg Caligaro from UCT led a study um, which really showed how um, important it is um, uh, that to, to get high flow, our, our um, survival uh, was good better, in fact, uh, in, at the time we were doing the study than uh, mechanically ventilating people. And we could also importantly predict using a special scoring system, a ROX6 score at six hours, when we checked how much oxygen was in the, in the circulating the blood with a special probe on the finger, we could tell people who were going to do well or maybe who would not do well and may require um, further intervention. Um, but if you had a ROX score of 3.7, your predict, uh, you had a good predictive. Um, it was a, a good, a good predicting if you could, if you would need, uh, uh, get better or not. The other thing we know is that actually proning people. So most people will lie generally on their backs, but um, that's actually very inefficient in terms of gas exchange. And so lying on your front actually uh, um, frees up 
uh, uh, space and opens up parts of the lung where gas exchange can occur. And what we found is that people's oxygen levels in blood will increase um, if you can get them on their front. So we do what's called conscious proning. That's been known in ICUs for a long time, but we now use it on the wards. You'll all be aware that steroids play an important part in our treatment now. This is the recovery trial. This is a forest plot. The trial, anything on the left-hand side of the line at one suggests uh, that dexamethasone acts better in the trials than you, uh, usual standard of care, which is without the dexamethasone. And what the recovery, sh uh, the recovery trial showed, which is a huge trial, giving oxygen to some and, and, uh, uh, and not to others, um, in terms of randomization, um, reduced uh, the oxygen, reduced the need for uh, ventilation. It, um, uh, sorry, the dexamethasone, giving dexamethasone to some and not others, sorry, not oxygen. The, the group that got the dexamethasone, if you were mechanically ventilated, there was a reduction in uh, death by a third. And if you were not ventilated, but you were requiring this high flow uh, and other oxygen, you had a reduction of um, a fifth. So this is really the treatment that has reduced mortality. Why? Because steroids work against inflammation predominantly. And uh, as I showed you, inflammation is important. The solidarity trial is also a big platform trial looking at different treatments um, in many countries in the world. Um, these big platform trials, adaptive trials, have been revolutionary, recovery and solidarity. We're involved in solidarity trial. Bottom line is much touted treatments by Trump and others, including hydroxychloroquine, one of the antiretrovirals, lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon, um, all had no uh, real um, benefit in terms of mortality. And those trials were stopped. And remdesivir, which is an antiviral, also had no evidence of a reduction in mortality. But in another trial, a final report um, recently in, uh, published in the New England Journal, showed that although it has no improvement in mortality, it does reduce the duration of hospital stay and ICU stay, and therefore may impact uh, within the epidemic. And in um, America, these are the guidelines, anyone who is hospitalized requiring oxygen will get remdesivir and dexamethasone. Um, in South Africa, we're not using remdesivir um, in the public system, certainly. Um, we don't think it supports a reduction, uh, a specific reduction in mortality, as I said. Generally, the guideline from WHO is hydroxychloroquine doesn't work, lopinavir, tonavir doesn't work, remdesivir um, recommendation would be very, very weak, but corticosteroids definitely do. And again, there's this question mark about other drugs which might reduce inflammation being involved uh, potentially as beneficial treatments. Um, one is a, a, a particular inhibitor of one of those cytokines, which causes a cytokine storm, the cytokine IL-6. This is tocilizumab, and again, different studies, um, a meta-analysis, which showed in five studies uh, until recently that there was no significant benefit for using tocilizumab um, to try and improve um, mortality. There's been a recent REMAP-CAP study, which has suggested that there may be some benefit from tocilizumab in um, critically, the most critically ill patients as compared to people that didn't and some reduction in time to uh, have stay in ICU. But this needs to be looked at closely in scrutiny next to the other studies. And so the jury is still a little bit out and these are interim results by peer review. Another type of therapy which gained some traction and some hope was giving the plasma of people who have recovered from um, from, from COVID um, to people who were ill with COVID now. And the idea there is that uh, they will have produced, the people who've had COVID will have produced potentially protective antibodies. And there were also a number of other things which might be of benefit. Um, 
the likely benefit of this would be in people in very early on rather than when already in people with severe or critical illness. And actually just yesterday, again, the recovery trial platform stopped recruitment as there was no benefit from um, convalescent plasma in reducing death. And I don't think that convalescent plasma, sadly, is going to play a major role. Also, you'll have heard of monoclonal antibodies. Trump got antibodies, the Regen COVID-2 COVID antibody. Again, these are synthetic antibodies which have been produced in laboratories, uh, which are then given to people in an attempt to reduce the virus by, by basically inhibiting or neutralizing its binding onto our cells and therefore um, negating the infection. Again, there's a still a big question mark around these and further trials need to be done. Lastly, there's this big Ferrari at the moment around ivermectin. This is a, a, a drug usually used in animals and occasionally in humans for particular specific type, type of worm infection and skin infections. Like hydroxychloroquine and some of the other candidates, it has some effect in the laboratory. We know against SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID, but the trials to date and the analyses to date do not support its use. Um, and in fact, the, the systematic review meta-analysis done by our own National Medicines, uh, Emergency Medicines List um, recommends that we do not use ivermectin at the moment. It is a source of intense scrutiny. There are other studies coming. Um, there may be a change in advice in uh, coming in future, but at the moment there is no ever good evidence that ivermectin should be used and anybody who's injecting animal product into them really is not doing themselves any favour. There is no evidence at present, good convincing evidence of prophylaxis or treatment. And just to say, one of the other um, effects we've seen in, in COVID patients with severe disease is that their blood clots um, more readily and they get thrombosis, so clots in the lungs, which damages air exchange and can be um, fatal. And so we give um, uh, blood thinning um, treatments to people who have um, severe COVID. Uh, I'm not going to go through this for time. Um, last part actually of this rapidly is uh, vaccines. Um, this is the most recent uh, up-to-date view of how many vaccines are in development both in the preclinical phase, in other words, before they get into trials, there's 173 different vaccines. In preclinical development, there's 63 vaccines in clinical development, in other words, in either in phase one, two or three trials. Um, vaccines are of different types. Um, often we would use an inactivated virus, um, for example, influenza's influenza vaccine uses inactivated viruses. These are vaccines which have been gen uh, viruses that have been generated um, like influenza or SARS-CoV-2 that are not able to replicate. And there are two um, such candidates for, for um, a, a vaccine that are currently in development by Chinese um, companies. And these uh, viruses would be presented to our immune system and try and stimulate an immune response. And then there is a, a, a variety of, of different types. There are what's called, um, uh, probably the most well known currently, are, um, are, are the, uh, the Oxford vaccine, um, which are non-replicating viral vectors. So we use a, 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 an adenovirus vector which doesn't replicate, but it delivers specific information to our cells to start producing um, important proteins which will train our immunity to um, see the virus if it gets in and disable it. And so the Oxford vir the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Chad Ox2, uh, Chad Ox2, Ox1, the um, uh, Johnson and Johnson virus uh, uh, vaccine as well is another um, another type. Protein subunits again will train our immune response. Novavax is one which is of interest. And then lastly, probably the best known, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. These are what's called RNA vaccine. They're packaged, so the bits of RNA, that genetic material, just short segments of it, coding for the spike protein, are put into lipid particles, injected into a cell, in, into, and they, sorry, 
they're injected, obviously vaccinated, we're vaccinated with these with these lipid coated RNA um, uh, containing RNA uh, sequences that get into our cells and they use our cell machinery, as I explained to you initially, um, as to, to produce spike protein, which trains our immune system again to recognize the vi virus when it comes in in the future. And the, the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, their efficacy, in other words, their reduction in severe, causing severe disease, clinical, well, in causing clinical disease is about over 95%. And there's also reports um, of the Oxford vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, with an overall um, effect, effect, efficacy of 70%. In more if you actually, if interestingly, have a lower dose as your first, these are all two dose vaccines. If your first dose is, if your first prime vaccine is slightly lower dose, it's half the dose. With the Oxford vaccine, you get a better response around 90%. And if you have a normal uh, single dose, um, not the half dose, you get 60%. Okay, so that's that's the end of the first part. Um, I'm actually, because of time and wanting to um, to have as, as much time for uh, much time for discussion as possible, I'm going to um, I'm going to just go on now uh, in the last half hour, an hour to just um, go into the second part of this. Um, but really, in the first part, what we've seen is, you know, what is the virus? How does it produce an immune response? What does it do to us clinically? Uh, what are the, how do we detect it? And what are the um, treatments and the vaccines? So now I'm going to first look at um, just certain issues. One is, you know, these are, are public health interventions, often called non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs, which aren't very, isn't a very nice term. But these are the things that we are growing, growing to live with over the last year. Social distancing, good ventilation, masking, hand hygiene, washing surfaces and isolating. OK, so why do we ask people to do this? What's the basis for this? Well, this virus, as you know, is, is in our upper respiratory um, tract. It's in our lungs. And basically, when viruses sit in uh, the upper respiratory tract in your nose and your airways, they're dispersed to the outside and potentially can infect people through droplets associated with mucus. And those can be large droplets generated usually from our upper airways um, or with the in this sort of old concept of things by much smaller droplets, which are lighter and can um, can stay up in the air for longer, and those are termed aerosols. And um, the, the sort of droplet transmission of viruses has been really sort of identified since the 1800s. Um, and then this differentiation between large and small droplets um, since the 1930s. And the idea is that if you if you are expelling a large droplet which has virus on it, that droplet's going to drop. Um, because it's heavy, uh, quite quickly to the ground, usually within a metre or so, whereas these small droplets could um, stay in the air and float further. Um, and so large droplets, you know, really within a metre, and that's one of the issues, of course, with our social distancing. We're trying to uh, increase the distance and, and get away from people who might be expiring, uh, expelling large droplets. So this is what I'm basically saying, large droplets will fall quickly, small droplets will remain airborne. And if you look at different diseases which um, are spread either by large droplets, again, respiratory viral infections, as opposed to airborne infections with TB and other things. But that, that thinking from the 1930s and 1800s has really developed and there's been an enormous amount of work done on how these viruses, how their SARS-CoV-2 and respiratory viruses are actually transmitted. And we now have a different concept of things. You know, when we speak, uh, when we breathe, when we shout, when we sing, we expel um, droplets which are in large turbulent gas clouds. And these gas clouds um, are quite humid. Um, some large droplets will still fall um, uh, quite early, but some, because of the humidity, um, uh, will be affected and there are 
the, the bottom line is really that there are, are large droplets and aerosols in in as that we expel as as humans um, in both um, uh, in these turbulent gas clouds. Clinically, there's be there is well, epidemiologically there's evidence to support that the COVID is transmitted by these large droplets or contact transmission. Uh, again, a very large number of cases. Look, the vast majority were within families in in close proximity, not just going into big open spaces. These were very close proximity. The household infection rates were high, and this epidemiologically suggests that large droplets play a role. However, in some of the studies, in particularly in hospitalised patients. SARS-CoV-2 has been found at remote areas of the room, not just near patient bedside, which would be large droplets, but in air fans on ceilings and on walls distant from the, um, from the patient. So it does look as if SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted by aerosols as well. Now, if you want to reduce aerosols, sorry, one of the ways to do that is to improve ventilation because the more times the air has changed, the more it will dilute out small droplets. If you want to reduce transmission from large droplet spread, then you will reduce the, sorry, you will increase the distance you are from somebody. And also because droplets drop onto surfaces with virus on it, you will clean surfaces and wash your hands well and commonly because you want to reduce transmission of that virus uh, to your mouth or nose where it can take hold. So this is the science behind, the concepts behind our use of masks, our use of social distancing and good ventilation. Interestingly, the loud you speak, shown on the top left hand panel in blue, uh, in fact in B, the loud you speak, the more particles you produce. And in fact, there are people in the lower panels that are super emitters. They're, these are probably the people that are super spreaders. So if they're either saying AAA or reading an English passage, most people will produce just relatively small numbers of particles, but some people will produce large numbers and are super emitters and therefore will super spread. And again, this is one of the pieces of evidence behind super spreaders. Uh, laboratory evidence, but it goes with um, epidemiological studies. So when are people most infectious? Well, the bottom line is that when you look of, at infectivity, people are most infectious in the two days before infection, uh, before symptoms occur, sorry, and in the first few days afterwards. And that's problematic because it, uh, it says that you are most infectious about the time you become symptomatic in the two days beforehand. And therefore you don't know that you're actually transmitting. And this graph shows a CT value, it's the PCR value. The higher, the, the lower the number um, at the top, the more virus is around. And basically it, it shows that about 50, almost 50%, half of all cases, um, secondary cases, uh, had virus transmitted by people who were not yet symptomatic. The other important thing to do, this study in nine patients looked at how long PCR, the test, was positive in people who had been hospitalised or had, been, had, had, um, had COVID. Not only how long the PCR was positive, but how long when they took the, tried to grow the virus um, from patients over time. When, how long would people be able, to, how do you be able to grow virus there? How long would live virus be transmitted? And all, the bottom line is that but although the PCR can remain, the test can remain positive for uh, days to weeks, in fact, sometimes in a, a few months, um, that virus is not live virus, which can be transmitted and cause infection in people. In fact, um, there wasn't live virus cultured from these patients after day eight. And this talks to our the duration that our isolation period is. We basically said if you've been isolated for 10 days, even though your PC may be PCR positive, we don't suggest that you actually test. But if you're if you if you've been 10 days in isolation from the time that your symptoms have started, then you are not going to be almost certainly not going to be transmitting live virus to anybody else and come out of isolation. Basically, the younger you are, the less likely you are to transmit. 
and that talks to the amount of virus. So the younger people, if you're less than 20, uh, 20 not only less susceptible, but you're less likely to transmit. And again, this has been used as in quite important in thinking about getting people back to school and universities. Um, and, and that's uh, again an important issue about transmission. What about masks? Well, there's all sorts, and I'm sure you have your favourite um, from wearing 100 to wearing a bra cap. But do masks work? What's the idea behind them? Well, when you wear a mask, you have some inward protection. So when you inhale, when you breathe in, there's a pressure difference created and the mask seals and reduces the amount getting into, into you. And if the seal's effective, it depends actually how good the mask is on protecting you, depends on the material that, that you have in the mask. Now, with, with um, cloth masks, the main issue of cloth masks, as you know, is to actually pre prevent transmission to others not so much to prevent transmission to you. Whereas in the hospital environments, healthcare settings, we wear surgical masks and something called N95 masks, which have much greater filtering capacity. And that's important because we're trying to protect um, ourselves from people who have very high amounts, amounts of virus. There's also outward protection, potential outward protection. These rather nice plots. You can see when people, when so this person is, um, expelling out a breath forcefully. You can see these sort of eddy currents that are vision, you can visualize um, with different types of mask. And the, on the top mask is a surgical mask and the bottom panels is a tighter fitting N95. And actually there's less outward projection with the N95 than there is with the, um, with the less fitting mask. But during explosive events, and particularly in, in hospitals, um, when you have people with um, with these events, it's important that the healthcare workers, in some instances, will wear these uh, these masks. The other important thing is, even if you're wearing a mask, physical distancing, social distancing, still is important. I mean, this look shows very nicely um, that even if you're wearing uh, a mask, if you have a um, uh, an exhalation, a, a, a high event, exhalation, a cough or a shout, then you are still going to produce particles, uh, droplets that will get through the mask. And therefore, even if you're wearing masks, you must continue to socially distance. And there have been many studies on the efficacy of masks, um, but in the, in the healthcare setting, this was one of the nicest in the pink pre-intervention without universal mask wearing and the positivity rate in healthcare workers. And in the green, once everyone, all the healthcare workers were wearing masks, the number of cases dropped. And there's no doubt either in the community that in the, or in, um, in the healthcare setting that universal masking is critical uh, prevention method. The role of fomites, in other words, on surfaces, um, the virus can, can survive on surfaces for different times, eight hours for copper, cardboard about 24 hours, stainless steel and plastic about 72, 48 to 72 hours. Um, and that's why we suggest surfaces are cleaned regularly, uh, particularly high impact surfaces like computer mice and computer keyboards, etc. But standard um, cleaning equipments, any bleach or chlorine, any alcohol will basically get rid of the virus on the, on the surface, as long as the virus is clean. You can't sterilize the surface if you haven't got a clean surface. You have to clean the surface first and then sterilize it. In the hospitals, we wear all sorts of equipment and the equipment has to be safety, has to be, um, will vary depending on what the situations are. The most high stringent, um, personal protective equipment we would use, the highest end would be for people um, who are generating a lot of small particles um, during intubation events and other things. Um, go into this. Often asked about airplanes, are they safe? Um, there are the air patterns, air flows in, in aircrafts are from top um, and being ex expelled in the bottom. 50% um, of the air is changed on each cycle. It goes through special HEPA filters, which will remove 99.7% of the microbes. And then there's mix with outside, uh, in, outside airs coming in and inside airs being re, 50% of inside airs being recirculated. So you've got a very high number of air changes. And you can reduce transmission risk by screening people out before getting into the aircraft, the use of masks, hand hygiene, et cetera. 
if you wear a mask during travel, if you travel by air, wear a mask. Without a mask, you're exposed, as your exposure time increases, your infection probability increases as shown in this mask, in this um, graph. If you're wearing a mask, you decrease the infection probability. Pre-test screening, needing a test negative, is not 100% foolproof to mean that you are going to be on a flight where everybody's been tested negative and not going to get it. This flight from Dubai to Auckland, 18 hours, with a stop for two hours in Kuala Lumpur. There was uh, people, uh, the people in blue, light blue and dark blue, were two Swiss travellers who had tested negative three days before, came onto the flight, were pre-symptomatic. Um, the one in light blue developed symptoms, I think, in the first day, day afterwards and transmitted to uh, the other people circled. And so um, this was a New Zealand study where, they, where they're very good at their epidemiology and their follow-up. So it's not full set, fail safe. So again, still use all these public health interventions. OK, what about the SARS, this new variant, so-called, um, we won't use the term South African var variant, I'll come back to why not later, but we term this variant's name we're currently using um, is 501YV2. Um, it's a variant that we're all concerned about. What about it? Well, if you look at our epidemiological curve for the year, these are the number of cases by week. And you'll see we had it by different provinces. You'll see we had our peak in June, July. June, July. Um, and then we had a, a nadir where we came off the peak at a period where we weren't seeing many infections. And then really come November, October, November, we started to see the second wave. And the red line shows a cumulative number of infections we have now in the country over, um, uh, 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 over uh, 1.2 million cases. And in our provinces, again, exactly the same you're seeing, but you're seeing also that they're in the purple uh, and the light and the um, royal blue, the royal blue, the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. That second wave started earlier, particularly in the second in the um, Eastern Cape. And one of the thoughts about this is because of mobility, particularly in the Western Cape, there was increased mobility in uh, red is more mobility than in blue. These are in different areas, each, each line across, so Cape Town, Metro, Garden Route, GR, etc. Um, during lockdown, there was very little mobility. As lockdown was eased, there was more mobility, particularly into the Garden Route and into neighbouring Eastern Cape. And this is one of the reasons we think why there was a, a, some, uh, the second wave started in those areas and within the Eastern Cape, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro. In terms of deaths, these are the un these are the we know that the deaths in confirmed cases currently around thirty five thousand in South Africa, but there's this un this uh, excess deaths that are shown. These bars, grey bars, vertical bars, show the difference between what we're seeing and the predicted amount for the time of year, and you can see that in the first and second wave we've increased the amount of. Uh, excess deaths and overall over the last year there have been 83,000 excess deaths, a lot of those being COVID. And if you look at the different areas in the country, the different provinces, the Eastern Cape excess deaths look as if it's plateauing, the Western Cape also we hope might be plateauing, we're not sure. There's always a delay, so although we're seeing a plat plateauing, we think now in Cape, in the Western Cape, the deaths will be two, two or three weeks behind. But in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, it's very much on the upward curve. The variant was first, this new variant, 5012, was uh, what, how we know it's there by fantastic work by Tulio de Oliveira leading it and many, many um, people in KZN uh, and all over the country um, in different laboratories. And basically the viruses that have been infecting people we've been surveying, we've been able to get those viruses, we've been able to do gene sequencing on them of the whole genome and we can read their sequences and see how they differ. And for the first months, uh, first months of the of the epidemic, you see different lineages, different uh, strains predominating in South Africa until around September the 28th, where there was this new introduction. A proportion of the sequences started to be overwhelmingly this new variant 501 Y2 or V2. 
and now pretty much all infections, almost all infections in South Africa are this new variant. This new variant has a number of mutations in the genome. What does that mean? The, the RNA that I, I showed you and talked about initially has a sequence. There are point mutations. In other words, specific letters in the sequence which change. This happens all the time, and most of the time it has no effect. But occasionally these are in, at important sites which gain the virus some advantage and they're naturally selected out or selected out through other means. And this new variant has a, a large number of mutations which are now fixed. In other words, all the viruses we're uh, genotyping are um, coming up with these same mutations. And problematically, um, these mutations, some of them, sit in the area of the spike protein which the antibodies generally recognize and remember our antibodies and our t-cell immunity in fact recognize the same areas and these recognition sites are critical in our fight against the virus so if the protein the, the genetic material changes and the protein changes the spike protein changes in this variant there's a possibility that our uh, immune system won't work as well and that's a particular, there's one particular mutation which you may have heard about E484K, and that's a particular hotspot of binding. And mutations at that site, at the 484 site, mutating from an E to a K in the terms of letters, actually does impact on the binding of antibodies. The other one that's important is the N501Y mutation, the mutation at 501. And that's also found in the UK variant and in a number of others. And what that does is it increases the strength of the binding of the virus to our ACE2 receptor and it increases the virus, the amount of virus getting in, increases the amount of virus being produced and therefore increases the amount of virus being expelled and we are seeing an increased transmissibility of the virus, the new variant, probably because largely about this 501 variant. This just shows that there's been spread. It's spread initially from the Eastern Cape, the Nelson Mandela Metro and uh, our apartment areas to KZN and the Western Cape. It's not a blame slide, it's just a factual slide. The UK, the variant that's in the UK, uh, sorry, apologies, the 501YR variant has now been found in a number of different other countries, sewn in blue. And so, you know, unfortunately, stopping travel um, is really after the horse has bolted. Once the, vi once the you know, travel, the virus has traveled all the time uh, with, with people traveling and it's already spread. The UK variant has also spread, I think, to 48 countries. This is the UK variant, has 17 mutations. A number of the ones which are shared by ours, including that 501, and they we're seeing in the UK a high, very high increase in transmissibility. But what the UK variant doesn't have um, is the 484 mutation, and therefore um, there may be a difference between how antibodies will bind. There's also a variant in Brazil, um, which um, is, does also contain the 484. And this just shows, um, it just backs up this issue about transmissibility. This is a study from the UK. And basically what it's showing is that this UK variant, the S, the S um, negative, has a higher, induces a higher viral load in people. In other words, people who are infected will produce more virus and likely to infect more people, and that's why it's more transmissible. The Brazilian variant as well has taken over again by months going from bottom up and by November in light green the variant this Brazilian variant with a new with a new um, mutation 484 um, has been found. There's lots of questions about our variant we need to answer the most important is if you have had a vaccine um, if with the current vaccines, is um, are those current vaccines going to protect against this new lineage? Um, if you uh, are you more, if you've had uh, SARS-CoV-2 before with a different lineage, are you going to be protected? In other words, will your antibody responses protect you? Does this new variant cause more severe disease? I don't think it does, and we're not seeing that. 
are on the ground. Um, and are the diagnostics picking it up and some other issues? So will a vaccine protect against um, this new lineage? This is a map of the, of the spike protein and it shows the points of the mutation where the mutations are. And unfortunately, this triad, this three mutations, 501, 417 and 484 in the center at the top, is a really critical hotspot where um, there's binding. So if there are mutations, particularly in 484 and 417, then antibodies are less likely to bind. There's also this part on the left, which has got a number of mutations called the N-terminal domain. And there's now starting to be evidence that that too might be important in neutralization. This actually just shows the same thing, so I'm not gonna go onto it. The bottom line is that in terms of our evidence to date, and this is rapidly being worked on, uh, but Tulio de Oliveira and all the, this is now a, a research consortium across South Africa, which is working together to feverishly do this work and find out what's happening and what the answers will be. I think what's going to happen is that you're going to see that antibodies that are generated either by the vaccine, certain antibodies, either by the vaccine or by natural infection, and people have had it before, are going to inhibit the virus to a lesser extent. Okay, it might even wipe it out in certain, it's to certain specific sites. But the issue is that immunity is much more complicated than a certain site and the different points of interaction in all the different types of our immune cell responses is very varied. And so these individual experiments do not mean that the whole is answers the whole. And those studies are really going to be required. What we need and what we've got and the work's being done is you take people that have been vaccinated with these vaccines and have been followed up where you have blood samples, you take their blood samples and you see whether that will inhibit this new variant. And if it does, the vaccine works. And if it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. Lastly, about the variants, the WHO are calling for us to not name the variants after the countries, stigmatization, et cetera. So we're not calling it the South African variant, although it's a difficult, um, difficult habit to break. If I want to, um, if I want to uh, have enough time for discussion, I'm not going to go through these last slides very, um, very much. I'm going to sort of skip through them over five minutes or so. But this basic, this slide basically, as it's as the title says, um, this is our experience in South Africa. And I don't really need to go into it because as we've all lived through it, uh, lockdowns, announcements, etc., alcohol banning, school closures, etc. But it really introduces the aspect, the issue about um, lockdowns and some of the just a couple of things I'm, I wanted to highlight and bring out. A lot of people are very upset about the alcohol ban. Why do we ban? Well, why do we do anything in terms of lockdown, curfews, banning? What we're trying to do, the bottom line is in a pandemic, you save the integrity of the health service. Now, alcohol equals trauma, which equals hospital admissions. And if you're overrun with increased numbers of COVID patients and you've got tons of trauma, your health system is under threat. And what this shows on each of the numbers, so in the, number one, the amount of trauma was at a low level because the alcohol ban was in place. Then it was uh, and it was reinstated. At number two, and these this peaks are the numbers of uh, trauma admissions on a seven day really average. As you can see, as the alcohol restrictions were were softened, the number of, of um, alcohol related trauma death, trauma in uh, admissions increase. And really, you have to ban alcohol, sadly, in the country because people will not um, moderate to turn off the trauma. And once you do, it turns off almost immediately. It sits equally once you put alcohol back in, it turns it on within 24 hours. So unfortunately, you're going to have to resort to getting alcohol in different ways. This is one that we've tried to champion. Um, of course, it's uh, not legal, but um, uh, it's up to you. Uh, if you contact me later, I can give you the... Uh, oh, no, it's, it tells you how to get it. Good. First time round, we set up... Um, most South African hospitals set up 
um, a service which focused almost entirely on COVID. We learnt that although this was successful in the end, and by the time we finished, there were about 500 different healthcare workers involved in the service at Khudaskir, from medics, surgeons, opticians, psychiatrists, everybody, nurses, everybody was involved. If you dedicate a health system entirely to one thing, you're going to um, cause problems with everything else. And we know in South Africa that there was an appalling neglect of TB, HIV, vaccine, cancer, etc. So second time round, we've had to we've had to change things, and we haven't got that buy-in. And actually, the stress on the people doing the work on the front line now in hospitals in South Africa is immense because you have less people involved because you're trying to continue services for other things. And that has merit. But when you hear about health healthcare professionals being stressed, uh, believe me, it's true. I'm not going to go into this for time. Um, I'm going to finish on the vi on the government's vaccine rollout plan because it's been a lot of the news. And Zapiro, as ever, hits a nail on the head. What a totally brilliant man! And this was, as you can see at the bottom, resembling the 2003 AIDS treatment plan, uh, the same sort of cartoon. The bottom line is that uh, the, the, our response um, has been slow, although it's now accelerating. We, there are various ways you can access vaccine. You can access vaccine by negotiations with pharmaceuticals direct, directly through bilateral negotiations. And then there's this new body called the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, ACTA, which is um, funded by various um, groups, including Global Fund. And the vaccine arm of it is something called COVAX which is the Global Alliance in Vaccine Initiative, uh, CEPI and the WHO. And this is basically an equity body and procurement body whereby countries that can afford to pay will pay full price and there's subsidization of lower income countries who are not able to, to um, pay. Unfortunately, South Africa being an upper middle income country has to pay full whack. And that's why we've been unable to procure our 20% population figure of vaccines that we would like and why the government has gone for 10%. So this is in the public domain, the vaccine rollout framework plan. I'm just going to take a couple of slides from it. In phase one, healthcare workers will be targeted um, and there'll be frontline healthcare workers. In phase two, essential workers. And in phase one, the vaccine is going to come, this 1.5 million doses that we bought from um, the Serum Institute in India, the, the Oxford uh, Chadox V vaccine, uh, which I mentioned. And that 1.5 million is meant to cover, that's 1.5 million doses, um, which is 750,000 people, which is meant to cover the healthcare workforce, uh, which is over 1.2 million. Then in the second phase, the idea is you're going to get the vaccine from COVAX. The COVAX, as I've said, is going to be 10% of our, our population, but I'll show you some figures in a minute. And the time frame is variable. It's going to be essential um, workers and then everybody else in phase three. Now, just um, putting a bit more detail on that, in phase one, you're going to be vaccinating healthcare workers. The target the population there is about 1.25 million. We've got 1.5 million doses, 750,000 people. So we don't have enough doses for the people, although there are quite a few people who won't want the vaccine, I guess. And the categories of healthcare workers, category one of those, is going to be really on the front line, highest risk, versus category five, which is much lower risk. And that likelihood is that the vaccine will be rolled out within hospitals. There may be some outreach, but not really in vaccine centres. Then you've got phase two and phase two, all these essential workers and it, these essential workers are listed up at the top under phase two. It's about 13 million people that requires about 26 million doses. Um, and that's going to be these essential workers, teachers, police officers, etc., um, prisoners, uh, people over 60 and people with comorbidities. The COVAX facility is going to give you 10% uh, of the population. Um, which is going to be nowhere near the amount of vaccine you're going to require in phase two. So there's a big vaccine deficit. And then in phase three, 22 million people, who knows? 
we've been assured by the health minister or we've been promised by and by the president that 67 percent of the population is going to be vaccinated before the end of the year now remember that kids under 16 don't get vaccinated so we're talking somewhere around 40 million people need to be vaccinated these are the resource requirements theoretically the government apparently wants 12 million people vaccinated over a nine month period with two doses so the maths doesn't add up um if you were going to do 130 million 130,000 vaccines a day 12 million people over nine months that would just be monday to friday why not the weekends it doesn't um doesn't add up. A vaccinator to vaccine, a vaccinator to vaccine to 50 people, approximately 2,600 vaccinators, but that doesn't bring in uh, absenteeism, you know, illness. I mean, it's just, it's a mess. You know, this isn't, this isn't going to do it. Um, it's poor. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of work still to be done. So in conclusion, to leave uh, 20, 25 minutes for discussion, um, this is where we sit as a as a, as a world population, two million deaths. Two million deaths, almost 100 million cases. Pandemic. This pandemic is hopefully, goodness, let's hope so, a once in a lifetime. Um, it's the greatest challenge to public health we've ever seen. It's been, um, uh, been associated with a scientific endeavour that's never been seen before. We're definitely better off a year down the line than we were, but there's huge number of things to answer. And as a country, um, we're still in, a, in, a, in you know, deep problems with severe issues around vaccine, uh, vaccine strategy. We I haven't talked about vaccine denial and the whole issue around that, but it might come up in questions. Um, thank you for joining me on this discussion. I know there's a lot of information I hope it's been of some use. I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll hand back over to, to you, Madi. Thank you very much for an absolutely excellent talk. Um, in terms of questions, you can either type your questions in the in the chat bar or in the chat feature, or you can raise your hand and then I probably can't see your name and then I'll ask Buyo to um, just read me the name. The first question has come in from somebody called Debs. Flu vaccines sometimes result in flu-like symptoms. Why? Is this relevant to the COVID-19 vaccine? So influenza vaccine, like all vaccines, um, generally causes pain at the site of the vaccine. There's often a, a misconception that influenza vaccine causes flu and flu-like symptoms. That, that isn't the case. The influenza vaccines uh, are not able, the influenza vaccine that you get uh, with the injection does not replicate. It doesn't cause an influenza infection itself. What, um, what, it, what is happening is that people who are vaccinated and who get symptoms within the next few days of a cold or flu-like illness have been infected with a respiratory virus, which is uh, not influenza. Or, I mean, it is also possible, of course, to be infected with influenza around the same time as you have the vaccine. As I've told you, the body's immune response, response to protect you usually takes seven to 10 days. And therefore, if you become yeah. symptomatic, then you've got something else. The vaccine doesn't cause it. And the COVID vaccines, these are vaccines which don't, they're not live virus vaccines. They don't set up COVID infections. They set up training for our immune system to be able to recognize the virus when it gets in again. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Bruce. Why are antibody specific tests a higher priority? So natural immunity and vaccinated immunity approach. Sorry, why are antibody tests not a higher priority? Bruce, I'm not sure what you mean by priority. Do you mean higher priority in how we as a country are managing the epidemic? If if that is the case. Sorry, 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 AJ, so I, I was struggling to unmute. So it is Bruce here. I, uh, it's just, if you have got limited vaccinations, there is a natural immunity out there, which might be well 
much more than tested. So why are we not trying to get specific antibodies out so you know who has a natural immunity and you can vaccinate those perhaps at the end of the program rather than not in the beginning? Yeah, so that's a good, it's a good question. I mean, firstly, if you're trying to vaccinate 40 million people as rapidly as possible, you would also have to do 40 million um, tests, which are is not easy. These are blood tests, remember, that have to go to laboratories. Um, and it's so, it, you know, it's fraught, it's fraught with problems. Currently, one of the questions in vaccination is whether you should be vaccinating people who've had natural infection. The WHO, current WHO recommendation is, is to say yes. The, the reason behind that is because our antibody response has waned. So they, they're, they're not permanent to SARS-CoV-2 and they do, uh, they do decrease. And also, uh, as I sort of mentioned, the antibody response will in part also depend on the severity of infection. So people who have very severe COVID who go into hospital um, and who are critically ill will have much stronger vaccine uh, antibody responses than those who are asymptomatic. So even though you may have a negative antibody uh, test, doesn't mean you've never had COVID. So, I mean, all in all, programmatically, it's not feasible to do antibody responses um, in everyone you wanted to vaccinate. Thank you. OK, we've got, um, so, sorry, let me just move my bar up a little bit. Um, here's a question. Can you speak about someone with severe allergies that cause anaphylactic shock and having the vaccine? Yeah, so <clears throat> it will, you need, if, if you are in that category, you need to talk to the, to the, your vaccine providers because um, the allergic response, I mean, firstly, anaphylaxis and allergic responses are to specific triggers. And uh, there are um, like in, you know, it, specific triggers in nature, um, people that have peanut al allergies, allergies to drugs, etc., can have anaphylactic, very life-threatening diseases, uh, life-threatening responses. Vaccines, certain vaccines can also, um, for certain people, induce an anaphylactic response. For example, influenza vaccine, influenza vaccines are made in eggs. If you have egg allergy, then there are op other options. You wouldn't use that vaccine. So there have been some, uh, there have been uh, very rare reports of um, allergic reaction in certain individuals, but they are again to potentially a specific vaccine. So you may not, you may have a, a, an issue with one vaccine, but another vaccine would be perfectly safe for you. So rather than going into specifics of specific allergies in specific people, I would suggest that you talk to your vaccine provider when the time comes. Okay, next question. Our second, this is from David Kirk. Our second wave, fingers crossed, seems to be slowing already, at least in the Eastern Cape and Western Cape. Do you believe our second wave may not be as bad as in so many other countries? Was this expected? So firstly, country, um, country to country uh, uh, part of the question. It's really impossible to, one shouldn't um, compare countries because, you know, the, the, everything's completely different, um, you know, from population to their prevention measures to everything, you know, take, for example, population, the very severe you know, high, high age group differences in population, for example, and then lockdown levels, the type of lockdown that happens in one country doesn't happen in another. And so, you know, comparing lockdown, comparing countries waves is very difficult. Our second wave has been, we've seen more cases in our second wave than we've seen in our first wave. Although we don't think that there's an increase in severity with the new variant and in the second wave, what that does is it puts greater pressure on the health system and the resources and therefore people that may have accessed an intensive care unit and been ventilated in the first wave may not have in the, may not in the second wave. So our second wave in numbers is greater than our first wave. In severity it isn't, but in our outcome it may well be. That, waits, that we need to wait to see. Was it predictable? Absolutely, 100% predictable, just as we're going to have a third and fourth wave. 
and possibly even more. We can't, I can't tell you how many ways we're going to have, but can I tell you, and I can't tell you that how, how high they're going to be or what they're going to look like because it depends on so many factors. But I, without, without rapid vaccination of at least two thirds of the population, um, or if not that, close to that with natural infection, we're not going to get to population immunity, which basically means that there are so many people in the population already infected and have immunity that the virus just can't take hold in enough people to continue its spread. Without that, you will, you'll, we will see another wave. Okay, before I go back to the questions in the chat feature, let me, I see a hand up whose name I can't see. Buyo, can you see whose hand is up? There's no hand up, Midi. Okay. Is it Anna Stoddart, I think? Oh, there is a hand up now. Um, okay. It's Anna. Okay, Anna, do you want to ask your question? You have to unmute, Anna. Hello. Okay, and I can't, I can't hear you. So if you want to, if you can type it in the chat. Uh, you can do it in language or in music. Okay, while we wait, Anna, while... Anna, Anna is a, an a internationally renowned harpsichordist. Oh really? Oh wow. Okay. And purveyor of fine bonbons on fine music radio. Oh wow. Baroque, okay. Baroque bonbons. And my Baroque being my favourite. Well, let's go back today to Lorraine. Lorraine had a question. If we know that our antibodies in response to COVID only last six to eight months, how long will our immune response last after being vaccinated? So the six to eight months is what we know from studies so far. That's not the, that's not the, um, the definite time frame. In most coronavirus infections, you do have a, a degree of protective immunity for you know 12 to 36 months so it's unknown at the moment because obviously we're only a year into this pandemic so you know it's going to take a historical look at this to be absolutely sure the other issue is as i've said that the antibody response can wane and there's many decrease and there's many factors which will which we're, that's dependent on um, as I've said, including severity uh, and our age, unfortunately, as we are as we get older, um, our, our, our immune systems um, undergo what's unfortunately called immunosenescence, which is a bit of an aging process. Um, so there are many factors which can which can um, impact. But um, if you've been naturally infected with COVID, if you've been symptomatic, and certainly if you've had severe infection, then I expect that you will have protective immunity for much longer than eight, week, eight months. Thank you. There's another question from David Kirk. An early slide showing adjusted hazard ratio seemed to suggest that those with asthma had lower risk. Is that right? Why is that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's that's that was data from Western Health, prob, health uh, West, the Western Cape province. Um, it's not. It's um, was chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So it um, it included uh, not just asthma. Um, David, I I don't want to give you the wrong um, the wrong information on this. I prefer to give you the right information. So. If you, if you contact me via email, mark.mendelson at uct.ac.za, then I will um, look into it further and come back to you on that. Thank you. I, I see a hand again, Buyo. It's still Anna. Well, Anna, so, oh dear, we don't have Anna. And there's no type message from Anna. Are there any other hands up, Buyo, that you can see? There's there are none, maybe. Okay, thank you. For, and, okay, and there are no more. There are no more questions in the chat, which tells me that your talk was incredibly comprehensive, um, and that you've probably preempted everybody's questions. Great. Uh, here's one more. Here's one more. Sorry, one's just popped in. 
Um, as a diabetic who has stayed at home since March 2019, I'm very interested in future predictions. What does your informed crystal ball predict? Oh, I just got to get it out. Um, I see one behind you on your filing cabinet. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, what does my crystal ball say? Um, my crystal ball says that, I mean, globally and, and, and nationally. So, um, Globally, I think we're living in a COVID world for the next uh, four to five years, probably. Um, I think nationally, our our vaccine, you know, the whole mitigating this epidemic in truth and trying to get back to um, close to what we, we had before. I don't think we're ever likely to, to, to fully get back, perhaps, but who knows? Um, I think that um, that we will see a number of different waves. I think in terms of vaccination, uh, if we vaccinate 15 to 20 percent of the population by the end of the year, we're probably doing well. I mean, the vaccination issue isn't just about, I mean, first and foremost, you have to have vaccine. I mean, a plan and a strategy is only as good as the number of vaccines you've got. But then remember, you've, this, you've got a distribution plan. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the entire, everything that has to be put in place, this should have been started six months ago. You know, the fact that we're in these discussions now is, is greatly problematic. Um, I'm afraid I think we're going to have to protect you for um, uh, uh, at least 18 months to, to two years. I'm delighted to be wrong. And they do say that the only predictable thing about viruses is their unpredictability. So, you know, who knows? Uh, and fingers crossed, but um, keep doing the public health interventions, take care of yourselves and your family and friends, and the sooner you can get vaccinated, the better. And here is somebody saying perhaps the last question. So let's make it the last question. What is your estimate re-naturally acquired immunity within the South African population? So it's going to differ very much depending on the area, the geographic area um, and the so social determinants. So in the Western Cape, um, in very high density areas, high transmission areas, Kailich and others, um, a zero survey, a survey for antibody responses in um, uh, pregnant women and HIV uh, patients showed 30 to 40 percent had antibodies. So when when there's uh, where, but but if you take if you then try and translate that to very low density, more affluent areas where there's much less overcrowding, people are you know maybe more able to um, to do, to uh, uh, to have social distancing and all the other issues, um, then it's going to be much less. Um, again, I think we're seeing a plateauing in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape now of cases because in most areas we're reaching that number of uh, high density infections. The three of the slides that I, I went over was a, a fascinating study um, from the United States which used big data, literally billions of time points looking at using cell phones and GPS to map um, different cities in the US, 10 different cities in the US, and they were able to subdivide into small units of six to three thousand six hundred to three thousand uh, people um, units in all over these different metros and they could map their movements um, and into they also were able to map all the different shops and restaurants and bars and everything and what it showed is that the lower your so their socioeconomic the lower the income bracket of a person the more mobility they had to have and the more time they had to spend in high density, high risk areas like shops and restaurants, uh, like shops and congregate areas. And this is one of the explanations probably for the greater COVID burden in the African-American population and um, cult population in America, which um, relates to socioeconomic groups. And it's important because of potentially of interventions, if you can change that, then you can impact um, on transmission. And that might be playing a role also here. Um, people, affluent, affluent people who can do shopping once a, once a month or once a week, 
um, with less transmission versus people who live hand to foot who are going to be going into areas in contact every day is very different transmission. So I think it's all going to play in. I've seen no other questions, uh, so thank you very, very, very much indeed um, for giving up your Saturday to talk to us. Pleasure. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, well, thank you, and thank you everybody for listening in. Um, we, we hope to see some of you on Monday, and take care, and, and a good afternoon, and bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah.